All right, guys, I'm going to be talking a little bit about wide receiver play today. Um, my thanks to Coach Banster for giving me the opportunity. Really excited to get to talk to you a little bit more about the specifics of how I structure wide receiver meetings, um, how I kind of look at the wide receiver as a position, and to get a little bit more into some of the kind of most essential things as far as wide receivers go. Uh, my name is Luke Poglaze. I'm the wide receivers and tight ends coach here at Kenyon College in Gambier, Ohio. Um, we're a D3 institution in the North Coast Athletic Conference. Um, so really excited to, to get the chance to speak with you all today. There you can see a little bit more of my information. Um, obviously, my Twitter handle. Please feel free to follow me on Twitter. Feel free to email me. That's my uh, Kenyan email address. And then my cell phone there at the bottom. Um, I'll have this slide up again at the end. Um, so if you have any issues copying this down, feel free to take a look at that then. A couple things we're going to be talking about today um, is just going to be the wide receiver position as a whole. What makes the wide receiver position special? Um, what makes it so unique? We're going to talk a little bit about the way I look at meetings and the way I, I think that's kind of important to, to structure meetings and to talk about the position uh, as a coach. We're going to talk a little bit about watching film from a wide receiver's perspective. Then we're going to talk about some pre-practice drills, some warm-ups I use, and kind of how that feeds back into what I emphasize at the position, you know, what I really look for in terms of players and what I look for in terms of being able to coach them. So just to start, what makes wide receiver special? Uh, I think it's an incredibly technical position. Um, you look at the, the amount of different technique that's needed to, to be a wide receiver um, and the amount of different things that wide receivers are asked to do. Um, and, and I think for, for, that, for that point, there's different models of success, right? Wide receivers come in, in many different shapes and sizes. Um, you know, we've got on our, on our roster, um, guys as tall as six, four and as short as five, seven guys as heavy as two Oh one and guys as light as one fifty. So it's not like there's a single mold that you will have success with at the wide receiver position, right? That you're going to have a variety of different guys, um, who are able to do different things and that those are all important and all valuable wide receiver. It's a position that takes place on an Island, right? You're one-on-one -on -one in space uh, with a lot of the time, if your best guy is playing on the best defender, that's going to be one of the marquee matchups on the field. And it takes place on an island. It takes place in, in yards and yards and yards of space. And you might have situations where you get, you know, 11, 12 guys in the box, right? Um, but uh, I guess 12, 13 guys in the box. But you're, you're going to have out in space on an island, you might have – two guys in just yards and yards of territory. And so it takes a special athlete to be able to really achieve success with that, with that space, to be able to take advantage of the space that you have and to be able to use that to your benefit and to be a superior athlete. Um, for me, playing wide receivers, both an art and a science. Um, you know, I think that there's obviously some incredibly gorgeous routes, right? That, that there's just such personal and artistic flair in a lot of the things that wide receivers do. But at the same time, I think it is a science as well. Um, you know, that there is a lot of technique that's needed um, from how you would address, you know, press coverage with inside leverage versus press coverage with outside leverage. And that goes back to it being an incredibly technical position. For me as a coach, um, I, you know, I, I believe in there, the, the, there, be, there is room for individuality for players. Um, and that again, that goes back to wide receivers, shapes and sizes and different models of success. My personal philosophy, my background, I don't want to overcoach or micromanage guys. Now there are things that I will emphasize. There are things that I'm going to make sure that our guys do, but I'm not going to necessarily uh, you know, micromanage them to, to fine tune specific elements. You know, guys are going to meet some baselines uh, and then there's going to be some, some room for adaptation within that. Um, you know, there's, there's going to be guys who all teach certain releases too. And there's going to be guys who quite honestly, that release may not athletically be possible for them. Right. So I'm not going to micromanage. I'm not going to require an overall standard. I want to leave some room for the individual to, to have success as a player and as a person. So I'm going to talk a little bit about wide receiver meeting structure. So typically in the season, I'll kind of start with, with game planning and with new installs. So I want to start with what's going in that week for the opponent. So, you know, typically for our, for our meetings, um, Sundays we have off. That's a pretty game plan intensive day. Uh, and so by the time we have meetings late Monday afternoon with the players, 
the majority of our game plan and any kind of new installs or new plays are going to be completed Sunday and Monday morning. So for us, it's going to start with whiteboard time. I'm going to get on the whiteboard. I'm going to draw up all the plays for that week. I'm going to go through it position by position to make sure that everybody understands what everybody resp everybody's responsibility is on the field at any one given time. My kind of key for that is that I always want to give the why. I always want to say not just what we're doing, but why we're doing it, right? I want to communicate the coach's perspective, and I want to clue our players into the game plan. Because once you get the opportunity to clue your players into the game plan, then they're active participants in, participants in it as well. And it creates a little bit more of a balanced interchange dynamic, right? I'm not just going to tell our players, we're going to do this, this, and this, because that's why, because the coaches said so. I don't feel like that encourages an, an active environment um, that encourages them to bring their own perspective and bring their own thoughts. Um, I've had receivers and, and other players in the past come up to me and say, hey, coach, you know, I was watching film. I, I think we can get them with this play. And I, I love that. There's nothing I love more than that because that shows me that they're actively listening. They're actively engaged, that not only do they know our offense, but they're then translating that to the next level of saying, well, here's our offense. Here's the defense. Here's what we can do to match that. So I always want to give the why to, to kind of further solidify what our game plan is going to be for that week, why we're doing it so that they understand, oh, it's not just that we want to, you know, run this play because this play is good for us. We run, want to run this play because maybe we're targeting a defender on the other side. Maybe we're targeting their scheme. And that goes into the next kind of bullet point there in terms of talking through the scheme and opponent. So we'll, we'll talk through any adjustments that we have for the week. So if we're going to specifically change or tweak something that we already do just to kind of fit it a little bit more to that, to that opponent for the week. Um, one thing that, that we'll do is in, in giving the why of what we are going to game plan for that week, we're going to go through, and if we have a specific play that's based on actual film of the opponent, we're going to go through and look at that film and look at what on that film is causing us to put in that new, new play or new game plan. So we're going to go back and look at the film. Maybe it's something in a, you know, another team has done to this opponent. We're going to say, here's what we're going to put in based on that play. So we want to go through, watch film. I want the guys to get a sense to, to kind of get a feel for the other de for the defense that we're going to be playing that week. So I want them to be able to watch film. I want to coach them through watching film. You know, I, I firmly believe as a coach that, that, you know, we have a responsibility um, given our experience in football that we need to kind of give the players a little bit of, of clarity of, in terms of what we're talking about. So as we talk through the opponent's scheme, my kind of philosophy is I want to show them a couple clips of kind of how they play their most common coverages to us, um, kind of some of the most common things that we're going to get, what kind of some of the tells might be for that. And then quite honestly, I'm just going to throw on a drive or two. We're just going to watch them kind of how they play down to down, what their posture is like, and we'll kind of get into a little bit more of that in a second. Another thing we do is we talk through the opponent. I'm going to talk through some possible reactions that we might get defensively. You know, if we start, if we come out with one thing on offense, how might the defense adjust to us based on what we've seen from them on film? Um, one example is if we go from two by two, 10 personnel, and we motion across to three by one, the team kind of typically will rock and roll their back end. You know, if we start hitting them with like a backside RPO glance or short post or something like that, you know, maybe they start to bump underneath and just kind of keep the safety structure the same. So kind of talk through the talk, the, the players through what we anticipate the defenses might re, uh, reaction might be to what we do on the field so that they're prepared for some eventualities that, that might, that might take place on the actual, in the actual game on Saturday. The further we get into the week, um, I want to, I want to watch more kind of practice emphasis, the closer we get to the game. Obviously the more we get to, to actually practice the game plan, practice maybe some of those new plays that we've just put in, and, and kind of talk about how that's looking, um, obviously coach them up based on the film of practice. For me personally, I want to put an emphasis on the player's perspective during that. Like we talked about, I don't want to be a guy who just talks at them the whole time. Um, as much as anything, I want to kind of defer to them. So might be the a wide receiver is running a dig and uh, you know, I want to give him the opportunity to talk, you know, through the, through the snap and say, Hey, here's what I saw on this route. 
So typically I'll kind of, when I'm watching film with them, when we're talking about coverage, I'll pause the play three times. I'll usually pause the film immediately once the second, once, once the camera starts rolling and everyone is lined up and I'll say, okay, what are your thoughts on the coverage here? Um, and I, I guess that kind of segues into our, into our next point in a second, but um, to kind of, to, to have those three pauses of the film and to talk about kind of how, how that works overall in, in our film review process. So just to talk through actually a couple of examples real quick of, of giving the why. This is one example. This was a, a game plan adjustment that we had, um, basically a different way to run four verts. We had this against a team that was pretty heavy man coverage in terms of a tendency to any kind of three by one uh, alignment like this. So we ended up running um, the, the number two receiver here. He's running a vert. He's kind of bending this. He wants to be bottom of the numbers. Uh, number three, he's going to aim to apex the hash in the top of the numbers here. And what we're going to get from our Z receiver here, he's, he's going to take, he's going to go about three yards upfield, stop, and then kind of wheel back underneath, aiming up the hash here. So with any kind of man coverage, um, this is going to be a real struggle for the defense to be able to defend um, because you're creating a natural rub just with putting so many bodies right here. So that if you've got any kind of corner, um, who's, who's out here on our Z receiver, right? He's going to have to go through a lot of different traffic just to be able to get back to this guy. And so typically you're able to hit with a window right here or a window right here, depending on kind of how you have any kind of mic back or how he might fly out to play this. So this was an adjustment that we put in specifically for one week, um, anticipating a lot of man to, to three by one. Um, and honestly, it, it worked for us and the defense didn't really react to it. But we were kind of talking through the why, and one thing that I specifically brought up is, you know, we think that this play is going to be effective even if the defense changes their coverage. So even if we're not getting man, you know, talking about some of the defenders' potential adjustments, um, some of the things they might potentially do instead um, to be able to combat this play. Um, like I said, we ended up getting man exclusively to this formation, so we were able to run this play a couple times. We got a couple touchdowns out of this that game. Okay, another thing right here, this was another kind of, uh, you know, this illustrates the importance of being able to talk about um, the overall why and to explaining the full play. So because of injuries, this kid right here, he ended up playing a position that he hadn't all week. Um, he had practiced at a different wide receiver position. And um, we had a little bit of, we had some injuries um, and then we had some, some kind of underperformance from other players on the field. So he hadn't played X really kind of all we can practice. He hadn't wrecked this play at all, but what we ended up having, he ended up on the field at X right here. So all we're going to basically have, we're just going to have your kind of generic follow concept right here. He's through and shallow. He's going to be running the follow route. He's going to have a hitch and then he's going to reset and kind of slither in. But he, he, like I said, he hadn't wrecked this play all week, but from, from our install meeting on Monday, he knew the overall concept of the play. He knew why we were doing it. And even though he had not repped this play in practice at all, he had never run this play before this moment, he understood the concept. And this is this is a true freshman. This kid is is brilliant, and he's going to have a great career. Um, and, you know, he ends up having the hitch right here. He kind of floats outside a little bit and then just turns it into a scramble drill, makes a great play for a touchdown right here. That I mean, that's, that's instincts right there. That's just great instincts. But, again, you can kind of see – um, you know, how a guy who, who didn't rep this position, he played Z all week in practice um, and then ended up getting thrown into X on game day, just understands the concept of the play. He understands what we're trying to accomplish and then ends up making a huge play on scramble drill for, for a big time touchdown for us. Um, again, that's kind of talking about our, our offense and kind of the way that, the, that we want to structure things and really emphasizing the why for our players, emphasizing why we're doing what we're doing in order to have success. So talking a little bit about watching film and we'll kind of get back to the three pauses here now. For me, I have three different times during a, during a film, during any given play that I'll pause the film. So I will always pause the play right as soon as the players are set, okay? First things first, when everybody is lined up, I want them to talk me through that I want to pause the play immediately before the ball is snapped. And I want to pause the play, you know, a second later than that or so 
um, a second after the ball is snapped, one to two seconds, to allow the play to kind of develop a little bit. And I think those three moments can give you a lot of information about a defense. Okay, first thing I'm going to have the wide receivers do when we line up on the field is we're going to identify the safeties. Who are the safeties and where are the safeties? Okay, a lot of defensive structure is built off of those safeties. Okay, you're going to, at the college level and and at the high school level, you're not going to have, you know, disguises like you will in the NFL where you'll have, you know, the free safety lined up, you know, in the A gap faking a blitz and then he drops back on the snap to play cover two because he's an athlete. <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't necessarily see disguises like that. You know, you might get some, some defenders that'll, that'll do kind of late roles in the, in the back end, but for the most part, the safeties are going to tell you a lot about the defense and they're going to give you information about where they are um, on the field. So we'll see kind of a couple examples of that in a moment. Um, one thing we really look for is if it's split depth of safety is if one is deeper than the other, um, obviously that's kind of a too high situation where if one is slightly deeper than the other, where we might kind of roll defensively. Another thing we'll look at is overhang structure, um, which also speaks to the overall defensive structure. Um, we see a lot of what we call special four, um, where you have the nickel playing outside of number two. Um, I know guys call that mini or special or star as well. Like there's every word in the book for it, but that's, you know, that's one thing we really see a lot of in our conference. Um, and so as a result, kind of identifying the overhang as well is important to, to understand where he's playing and what his responsibilities are. My rule, cornerback is the least trustworthy position on the field, right? The guy who's going to be covering you is going to have every reason in the book not to tell you what he's going to do. Um, so based on identifying the safeties, you're going to have a much better success uh, opportunity for success in terms of in terms of being able to identify the safeties and what they might be doing as opposed to the cornerbacks because cornerbacks can disguise everything and they could line up and press and move to off right before the ball is snapped. Um, you know, anything like that, but, but safeties, you know, they can disguise it. There's some teams who do a great job of disguising it right at the snap, but for the most part, safeties are going to, you know, be a little, they're going to show a little bit more than, than the corners are. Um, the other thing finally is I just tell the guys to watch for defensive posture where is where defenders wait um you know if a if a overhang is you know lined up two by two inside of number two um but he's kind of got a heavy he's heavy on that front foot looking like he's going to blitz identify that call that out um you know understand the overall defensive posture are they you know are the defenders you know eight ten yards off and looking loose well you're probably getting a looser coverage are they a little bit tense or in kind of moving around a little bit well you might be getting some kind of blitz just to talk through kind of a couple different things, you know, this is one of those where my first pause is right here. Um, you know, kind of everybody's lined up, everybody's static. We're getting two tight corners here, right? Safeties are off about 10 yards, okay, about nine yards over here. So we're going to do a, a great job here of identifying where the safeties, where they lined up. Um, overhangs are maybe a yard inside in both cases. So we're, we've got a pretty good sense of what this is going to be. Um, knowing this team, we're going to get some kind of cover four because we've done our homework. We've done our film study. Um, we're more than likely going to get a four where we play a little bit tighter on the outside with maybe some, some main coverage on the outside receivers. Okay. Pause it immediately. Once the ball is snapped. Okay. Corners have not changed their posture. Okay. So they're still tight. We're still getting man coverage here. And we're still getting that too high shell. Okay. Now you compare that to the to the next exact play right here, okay? Again, we're going to pause this at the earliest opportunity once everybody is set. The very next play, okay? We're getting the same posture from the corners. They're a little bit off. They're facing the wide receiver. We're thinking man here. But you look at the level of the safeties, okay? He's at about 10 yards. He's a little bit shorter. He's at about 8 yards. So we can already identify that the safeties are at different depths here. And these, this is this is things that I want to coach my players to to look at in terms of identifying identifying the defensive structure in terms of identifying space. Defenses are going to to have you know plans to fill space. So when you have an overhang who's now tightened way down inside, lined up outside the tackle, right? You've got a void of space right here. You've got a low safety, so it's usually pretty reasonable to assume he's either going to fill that. Or this aggressive posture linebacker is going to drop back into that space. 
So again, it's about identifying the safety structure, the overhang structure, and where we see everything in the defense. So that's my first pause, right? Your second pause is going to be right when the ball is snapped. Okay, we've got this safety rolling to the middle of the field. This safety is rolling down. We're getting the overhang blitz off the edge. And what are we getting? These corners who had the same exact posture on the previous play, they're going to open up and they're going to bail. Okay. Again, corners, corners don't lie. The corners look the exact same on the play before, right? Or excuse me, corners will lie. Cornerbacks do lie to you. Um, like I said, they, they look the exact same on the play before. Um, and they've, they've completely changed their posture. They've completely changed what their assignment is once the ball is snapped here. But again, we had an indication that this safety was coming down because he was a little bit lower and we had a tight overhang. So he had to come down to fill this space. This guy is going to roll to the middle of the field because he was a little bit higher. So again, that's just a little bit about kind of some of the things that we talk about when we watch film, when we identify the defense and identify the defensive structure. You'll get some great adjustments on the field. Um, DePaul got us early on in this game with the corner blitz. Okay, this is a great job by our Z receiver here, identifying a really aggressive defensive posture by the corner right here. He's got eyes really hard inside. We've got a really tight safety who's kind of scooched over here. So we're expecting some kind of corner blitz here and that the safety is going to pick him up. So we do a great job identifying this, right? He calls this out. Our tight end here is going to do a great job coming over, picking up the corner blitz and giving us enough time to be able to throw this ball out up the seam for the, for the running back for a touchdown. Again, that's a situation of understanding and talking through in practice. Okay. What's the defense's tendencies? What are some things we're going to get from them? Again, when, when the ball is snapped, we can see that this is clearly something else here, right? That the, the defense is going to given us enough of an indication of what's going to happen, you know, this corner can lie, right? This corner can, can, I mean, obviously he's got eyes hard inside for most of this play right here, right? He's looking inside, but this safety, if he's going to pick this up and this receiver up, he's got to be over there already. That, that safety can't, can't hide that. He can't lie on that. Um, so again, you know, we want to identify the safeties. We want to talk about where they're going to be um, as opposed to the corners um, when it comes to our, our overall practice, how we talk about that and how we structure a week in terms of giving our defense, our offense the best looks against the team's defense. Okay, my practice mentality, some of the things that I emphasize, practice doesn't make perfect, practice makes permanent. Um, I know that everybody, you know, there's, a, there's the expression that goes around, practice makes perfect. If you practice poorly, you will play poorly. Um, and if you don't emphasize the right things in practice, then you're going to create bad habits. So practice doesn't make perfect, Practice makes permanent. Practice how you play. If you practice poorly, that's not going to translate on game day and you will end up playing poorly. So that's one big emphasis of mine. Um, just to talk through a couple of pre-practice drills and warm-ups that I emphasize. Um, tennis balls, I think, are a great way to start kind of improving players' hand-eye coordination to get them kind of clued in before practice. We want to partner up five yards apart. We'll push back to 10 yards apart. Um, we'll throw tennis balls back and forth, right hand to right hand, left hand to left hand, et cetera, kind of mixing up what we do with that. Combo cones, this is a drill I love. Um, it's a great kind of warm-up drill for our guys. Um, we want to do this at a jog through tempo. Um, I want to hear an audible stomp on this bit. So what we're going to do, we're going to have, we're going to be facing forward for this initial portion. Okay, these cones are about one yard apart. What we're going to do is we're going to keep our hips forward. We're going to pump our arms and we're going to have an audible stomp. What we want to do is stitch turf. So as much feet as possible, as much feet as possible, and then stick and emphasize a foot as much feet as possible, stick and emphasize a foot. We're just doing this at a jog through tempo. We're not trying to burn through. We're not trying to do any kind of conditioning work here. We're just going to go at a nice steady jog tempo, jog tempo. Again, we want as much feet and as much hands as possible. So we should be pop, 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 stomp. Hold it. Up, 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 up. Stomp, hold it. So we want to we want to create a great warm up here in terms of opening up um, our feet and kind of getting those warmed up as well as our hands. And then once we get up to here, these should all be about five yards apart. This is all five, and then we're going to turn face here, and we have some options on what we want to do with these cones here. Okay, we can either single step cut, we can beat the drum. Okay, break down on that. 
So this is just a great warm up for us to emphasize some of our some of our cuts, some of our breaks, and to just kind of warm up our hands and feet a little bit. Okay, four cone square. Everybody in the world does it. You can emphasize any kind of break or change of direction with it. Um, you can obviously go, you know, here again. You can single step, beat the drum, whatever it is. You can work your kind of comeback angles by going up here. You know, any kind of double move angles, things like that. So the the four cone square is great resource, obviously. Um, that's not that's not anything crazy, nothing game breaking right there. Settle drill, it's an air raid drill. Um, you know, for me, all of these drills are going to translate some way into making sure that you have a great day of practice and in terms of getting your guys ready to go. So this this is a great drill to kind of warm up everything. It's kind of putting a couple of those together. We're going to release off a dummy. We're going to break down at each side of the drill. We're going to settle to quarterback. Settle for the quarterback. He's going to throw the ball to one of our shoulders. Okay, this is important. Um, you'll see here on my player, I want this to be thrown either here or here. Okay. I want this to be thrown to one of his shoulders so that he can drop step to that side and get up field. Okay. Receivers instinct should always be to trust the quarterback and follow his throw. So that means if the quarterback throws me to this shoulder, that means the quarterback has the best angle on me. He sees a defender inside. He, he's going to throw me to this shoulder, which tells me, Hey, I'm throwing to you to this shoulder because that's the way I want you to go. So we need to trust our quarterback, trust his accuracy in terms of drop stepping and then getting up field. Okay. This video is from, I think coach Grabowski on YouTube. Um, I don't have a video of settle drill, so you can kind of see what this looks like. Um, we use the, you know, the big pop-up dummies right here. So what we're going to do is we're just going to be able to release off of that slow tempo kind of back and forth and then settle in the middle let the quarterback throw us a shoulder, and then we're going to drop step and get up field to that shoulder. Again, we want to break down at each side. You can do this five yards apart, right? You can do this 10 yards apart. Um, both ways are going to be a great way for you to be able to practice, um, you know, subtle drill where the quarterback throws you to a shoulder, uh, and then you're able to just drop step and get up field from there. Again, you can kind of see our points of emphasis beating the drum when you get to a point and then letting the quarterback throw you upfield to a shoulder. Routes on air, pat and go. Um, again, probably something that everybody does. Just kind of a routes on air to be able to warm up. We'll usually use this week to week for any kind of game plan specific adjustments. So before we run, you know, our specific play that we might have adjusted or put in for that week, okay, we're going to run. We're going to do that in routes on air. We're going to work on that in terms of you know, being, being able to, to rep the routes, rep the combinations with the quarterbacks before we go against, you know, the defense in, in seven on seven or before we go against the defense in full team. So we want to be able to rep those combinations already uh, so that our guys get a little bit comfortable so that the first time they're running it isn't necessarily going to be against the defense. Okay, press release I'll use as a warm-up. Really want to emphasize getting skinny. Um, we're going to restack, get back to our red line, which is the original line of release. So, so we give the quarterback room outside. Again, this is just a good little kind of warm-up drill you can do just with crayons. Just give them, give them a punch here. We want to get skinny, get low, and just recover back to that original line of release, which you can see right here, right? We're doing this on a yard line, so it should be pretty clear for them what that original line they need to get back to is. Again, nothing complicated here. Just want to work on that kind of original line of release, just, just getting skinny and getting back vertical to it. Okay, weak shoulder cut. This is um, a pretty, pretty straightforward drill. It's going to be a way to be elusive in the open field. We want to, you know, this is a situation where it's us one-on-one -on -one in space against a defender. Again, this goes back into wide receiver being uh, you know, a special position in terms of being able to attack defender's leverage. So if we're one-on-one -on -one in space with a defender, we're going to attack the sideline. Okay, We're going to try and beat him with speed outside, and then we're going to read his body for the cut. Again, reading his posture. For this, this is, a, this is a quick and easy way for us to be able to warm up while it's emphasizing an open field make miss. So we want to make the defender miss here. Okay, Weak shoulder cut. We'll, we'll kind of see better on the, uh, on the next example here. So you'll see me playing the defender here, right? One-on-one -on -one in space, 
We want to attack his weak shoulder. His strong shoulder is to the field, right? He's got all this space out here, but his weak shoulder is going to be to the sideline. We want to try and beat him with speed outside, okay? If he slow shuffles and we're able to beat with him with speed outside, we go. We're going to attack that weak shoulder, get across his face, and beat him outside, okay? Now, if, if he, if he over pursues us to the sideline, we're going to cut off that weak shoulder and we're going to be able to get back across his face into the open field. So we kind of see that slow shuffle, beat him with speed outside. If he's really aggressive, still slow shuffle. If he's really aggressive, we want to cut across his face and beat him with speed outside. Let me see if I can get one of those. There you go. There's that aggressive posture, right? We want to attack that weak shoulder, stick our foot in the ground, and cut off that back here, okay? This is just an easy way for us to already be thinking about making guys miss in the open field, right? We're already emphasizing that for our players in a warm-up here. We should already be thinking about that. Well, it's a great way for them to get warmed up and kind of get into game speed here in terms of being able to, to make guys miss in the open field. So that's all I've got for you guys here today. I really appreciate your time. Um, like I said, my contact information is there on the screen. Um, really, when it comes down to it, wide receivers, tight ends, guys, you know, I want to emphasize in, in meetings the things that are going to be important that are going to translate to the practice field and ultimately to, the, to game day. Um, again, I want to structure warm-ups. I want to structure practice in a way that's going to lend itself to playing games on, on Saturday, on Friday, on Sunday, right? I want to be able to, to put together a practice plan in terms of warm-ups, uh, in terms of, you know, pre-practice drills that I want to be able to translate. And so I want to teach important skills in our meetings that's going to help them out when it comes to being able to read defenses and understand their assignments on game day. Um, you know, I, I firmly believe that that you have to talk through certain things in, in meetings that is going to really set the, the, the base expectation for how practice is going to go and ultimately how your games are going to go, you know, set, set a firm structure and most importantly, clue guys in, make sure that they understand what they're doing, why they're doing it and when they're doing it. Um, because at the end of the day, they're the ones who have to go out and execute it on the field. And so you need to make sure that it's, that it's clear because when it comes down to the third and fourth quarter, guys come back to the sideline saying, Hey coach, you know, I think we can get them if we just tweak this, you know, if they're the guys on the field at the end of the day. You know, you can make great game plan adjustments based on that if guys understand the game the game plan. So thanks again to Coach Banster. I really appreciate you having me on. And um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to reach out to me based on any of the information below.